All right, guys, uh, welcome back. This is part three of uh, my commentary and close reading of uh, Ed and Matthew Pajot's The Language of Creation, Cosmic Symbols in Genesis. Um, the first two videos covered part one, which was salvaging creation from the scientific worldview, part two, which was heaven and earth in biblical cosmology, and part three, which we went about halfway through uh, last time, is entitled Heaven and Earth on the Human Scale. Uh, so as you can see, this book works its way up. It's it's uh, it, it, as you read the content and as you start to understand the concepts, which are ironically um, simple, extremely simple, almost too simple to grasp. Um, it builds up into this worldview and it op and it unlocks the later stages of the book. And uh, you can make more sense of what was, at least for me, kind of uh, cryptic passages in the Bible. And we're going to get into some of those here. And I'm going to try to approach them from a scientific materialist perspective, encountering this worldview and um, being open to it and, and kind of uh, looking at it from th that perspective. Um, so we're going to we got about 25 pages, the last uh, five or so chapters. Uh, tw chapter 20 is which we'll start. It is entitled Sexuality as Microcosm, Adam's Multiplication. Um, and then we have four examples. Uh, the next four chapters, example one is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Two, chapter two is uh, raising a nation from the earth. And then tw chapter 23, uh, materializing laws from heaven. And chapter 24 is authority and power. Uh, chapter 25 is Adam's Descendants as Microcosm. Again, we're going to be seeing a lot of this interplay and example of microcosm and macrocosm and heaven and earth in these examples. Um, and then we have chapter 26 and chapter 27 are building the temple one and building the temple two. Chapter 28 is the cherubim of Ezekiel. Chapter 29, Noah's Descendants as Microcosm. And then chapter 30 to close out this section, part three is Jacob's Ladder. So thanks for joining me here. Um, I hope you guys get some of the, get something out of this. And I really highly encourage you to buy this book and read it uh, and read it every six months. And, um, you know, it will give you a, 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 an amazing toolkit to understand things, not only in, in terms of the Bible, but in terms of what's happening right now, uh, politically, socially, economically. And it actually gives you a, it's sort of a relieving point of view uh, it, it gives you hope and it gives you understanding and it kind of situates you appropriately, I think. So I highly recommend it, um, again, especially for those scientific minded folks. You know, this isn't a critique of science. It's a um, it's a situating science within the spiritual worldview and not, again, favoring one over the other, but favoring not facing the one, the spiritual worldview in um, in terms of the others, kind of what uh, Mathieu is, is saying, that kind of the position that we're in right now, and I, and I tend to agree with him. So um, thanks for uh, joining me, and let's get started here. All right, chapter 20, entitled Sexuality as Microcosm, uh, Adam's Multiplication, and I'm going to try to just review this chapter here. Uh, the key idea that we've been working our way up to towards is this idea as Adam being both individual and collective. Uh, the term Adam means, um, of course, an individual, but also it means humanity. And the way that we can think about this fundamental structure of this uh, microcosm of, of heaven and earth, that is the uh, manifestation of, of Adam as mediator, is important to really understand this point as the it, this is reflected in both the individual and the collective level. So the four kind of levels that are uh, discussed and are used to, to situate this, this kind of fundamental pattern of Adam is uh, on the individual level. We have heaven and earth manifesting as uh, the head and the body, right? Again, remember, we have these two forces constantly in interplay in this, in this epistemology, right? So you have heaven, which lowers and informs, and we have earth, which supports, right? So that the head informs the body, the body supports the head. Um, Quickly here we have, so the different levels, right? The individual level, uh, the commentary writes here, the individual level defines Adam as the sum of his body parts, head, heart, arms, legs, etc. It involves joining heaven and earth at the individual scale by correctly expressing the intentions of the head with the actions of the arms and the legs, right? And then above the individual level is the communal level, 
right? So the communal level is that of the entire society and the interactions between its members. It involves joining heaven and earth at the communal scale by formulating a common identity as leader and expressing its laws as member. Think about this in terms of the United States, right? America, America is the spiritual identity, is the identity of the members, the citizens that make up um, the United States, that make up America. But again, we have fractals within fractals. So I live in Florida. So I am a part of the body of the spiritual identity that is Florida, right? Which is in itself a part of the higher identity, which is America, right? You can see how this is, uh, these are kind of nested together. And um, when it says here, joining heaven and earth at the communal scale by formulating a common identity as leader and expressing its laws as member. So if the leaders and the members are incongruent, if there is not a appropriate mediation of heaven and earth, you will have a disintegration of the higher identity, which a lot of folks would say that this is happening um, in the United States right now. And we could also see this uh, example in terms of Nazi Germany, right? So you had this very um, strong yet maladaptive connection between heaven and earth. The, the over, uh, the hyper idealized uh, state of, of Hitler with the members of, of, the, of the German body, right? Becoming uh, entranced and, and inculcated in Hitler's, um, you know, high level ideological um, understanding and rants, right? So you could see this in, on different levels. So at the communal level, um, at the next level up is the intercommunal, which are, uh, the intercommunal level is that of subgroups within a whole. For example, it may evolve the interactions of social classes in a greater society or different nations in an empire. And then finally, the cosmic level, which it defines Adam as mediator, as a mediator between heaven and earth with the responsibility of hosting angels and naming animals. And then the last paragraph of the chapter, uh, for each of these scales, notions like body and soul follow the same basic patterns. For example, at the communal level, there must be an invisible principle or spirit above a mass of individuals for its members to act in tandem. In this case, breath also plays a crucial role in connecting the head of the community to its body because every society needs a common discourse to link its population to the abstract identity. Learning to perceive the universe in terms of microcosms is a necessary step towards rediscovering the spiritual world view. These various levels of interpretation will become increasingly important in the following sections of this commentary as the key to deciphering biblical narratives. All right. Chapter one is example is an example of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he, um, the Bible quote the, at, the, at the beginning is, This image, which was large and whose brightness was surpassing, stood before you. The commentary writes, Nebuchadnezzar's story is an example of seeing reality in terms of microcosms at different scales of interpretation. And then from scripture, Daniel 2.31, this image, which was large and whose brightness was surpassing, stood before you. Its head was fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and its thighs were brass. Its legs were iron and its feet were iron and clay. Commentary in Matthew writes, In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the statue itself corresponds to the individual scale of interpretation because it is a human figure with its body parts, head, chest, arms, legs, etc. The head is the source of breath and language for the body, so it is made from the brightest and rarest of metals. The lower levels are source of power, arms and support, legs, so they are made from the harder and more common metals. Because of analogies between different levels of human organization, Daniel interprets the individual imagery of Nebuchadnezzar's dream at a completely different scale, the intercommunal scale. And here's Daniel's interpretation from uh, Daniel 2, 38, 42. You, O king, are the head of gold to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom. After you shall rise an inferior kingdom and a third kingdom of brass to rule over all the earth, the fourth kingdom will be strong as iron and will break them all into pieces. The feet and toes, partly clay and iron, will be a divided kingdom, strong and partly broken. In the commentary, 
In Daniel's interpretation, the layers of the body are translated into a series of empires that gradually become less coherent as they grow in power and size. The first empire starts with a high degree of meaning and low degree of corporeality at the price of their spiritual coherence. Importantly, Nebuchadnezzar's dream could have also been interpreted at the communal scale in terms of social classes. In that case, there would be a clear analogy with the degree of authority and power of the following social classes, priests, nobles, merchants, and laborers. As will be discovered in this commentary, such interconnected analogies between different scales are commonplace in ancient cosmology. All right, that's the end of chapter uh, 21. Next, we'll be getting into chapter 22 here. Chapter 22 is um, another example entitled Raising a Nation from the Earth. And again, we're going to be exploring these two fundamental forces, right? This, this raising of dust and this lowering of breath. And the chapter is introduced with this quote from Scripture. God formed the human from the dust of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. So forming from dust, right? Raising the earth, raising dust, and then blew into his nostrils the breath of life. So a lowering of breath and a raising of matter. So a lowering of meaning and a raising of matter, right? And in the between, you have the mediator, which in this case, in this example, will be Moses. So it's a simplified um, example of Exodus here that is meant to show Moses as mediator of these two fundamental forces. It says here, the following example from the book of Exodus is meant to be interpreted according to this pattern. In this scenario, Moses climbs the holy mountain to receive a heavenly name from God. He then descends the mountain to transmit this identity to the nation of Israel and raise them from slavery in Egypt. Again, keep this pattern in mind here. So here's a quote from Exodus 3. Moses came to the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared in a flame at the center of a bush that burned without being consumed. God said, I have come down to deliver my people from Egypt and raise them up from that earth. Moses says, when I say to the children of Israel that the God of their fathers has sent me, they'll ask, what is his name and what shall I say? God says, I am what I am. You shall say to the children of Israel that being has sent you. There's some commentary here. The story of Exodus is a detailed reiteration of the following verse. God formed the human from the dust of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. In this context, the raised dust is the population of Israel, stranded in the land of Egypt, and the lowered breath is the angel of the Lord speaking in the name of God on the mountain. Uh, footnote, like the tree, the mountain is a symbol of the spatial access. We'll, getting, we'll be getting into to time and space in the next section here. Uh, more commentary here. As discussed in, oh no, there's a quote here. I have descended to deliver my people from Egypt and raise them up from that earth. Commentary, as discussed in previous chapters, the descending and ascending influences are irre irrevocably linked. God can lower his identity through the vehicles of meaning and language, but this invisible breath must be met from below with a body that physically expresses its meaning. Back to the quote here. When they ask, what is his name, what shall I say? I am what I am. You shall say that being has sent you. Commentary here. In this narrative, God's identity is expressed as a singular name, which is the clearest example of a seed in the Bible. This name is a spiritual principle, a point of wisdom with great ramifications. As an identity, being suggests nothing specific, but implicitly contains all of creation in its scope. Thus, as detailed in the following example, the revelation of God's identity was only the first step towards the materialization of this heavenly seed. Quote from Exodus here. After the children of Israel left in the land of Egypt, they came into the wilderness of Sinai and encamped before the mountain. Moses ascended to God, who called him from the mountain. God says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I have lifted you on eagles' wings. So footnote, the ascending eagles of this narrative should be compared to the ascending quails um, opposite the descending manna that we were discussed earlier. 
So God says, you have been, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I lifted you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. If you hear my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be a kingdom of priests and a sacred nation. Moses came down the mountain and called the elders. He then transmitted all the words commanded to him by God. All the people answered together, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people back to the Lord. And here's the, um, the point driving things home here. In the story, the materialization of God's identity required the following agreement between spiritual and corporeal realities. All that the Lord has spoken in breath, we will do in body. At the communal level, an agreement or covenant between heaven and earth implies proper exchanges of laws and deeds. God provides a spiritual identity or soul from heaven, and the population provides physical expression or body from earth, from the earth. This exchange is no different than how a head and a body cooperate at the individual level. In this case, an agreement must be reached between the spirit and the flesh, by which the body correctly expresses the ideas of the mind in exchange for the leadership and direction of the head. Similarly, at the communal level, the population of Israel becomes a great physical body for God's spirit when it agrees to follow the divine law. Next will be uh, chapter 23, another example of uh, materializing laws from heaven. Chapter 23, we have another example. It's entitled Materializing Laws from Heaven. And here we're going to look at the Mosaic Law as it is definitely a means of preserving social order, but it's more than that. It is um, a way for uh, God's identity to be manifested through and in humanity. We're going to look at uh, what the term I am what I am, how we can understand that uh, within this context. Um, and then we're going to look at um, the relationship between a tree and a seed. And again, keep this fundamental pattern of heaven and earth in the back of your head, right? Of lowering meaning and raising matter. And the uh, appropriate mediation of the two through Moses is, is what we're exploring here. And the ramifications of this uh, rubric at the individual, the communal, the intercommunal, and the cosmic scale. So back to the quote was, God formed the human from the dust and of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. Again, that pattern uh, being manifested. The previous chapter, a covenant between God and Israel was made by which an entire population agreed to perform with deeds every word that God had spoken. To fully grasp the implications of this idea, it is important to realize that Mosaic law is more than just the means of preserving social order. It is also a way to express a spiritual identity in other words, every law is a specific ramification of God's identity at the level of human interactions. Back to the quote here. What shall I say if they ask, what is his name? I am what I am. The people answered, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Commentary. Even though God's name is extremely simple, it fully encapsulates the agreement between Israel and God to, quote, perform with deeds everything spoken with words. Close quote. Or, I am indeed what I am in word. Or, I am on earth what I am in heaven. So even though it appears to say very little, this name perfectly symbolizes the seed that contains the entire agreement in principle. This cosmic seed resembles an axiom in mathematics, a self-evident principle that cannot be proven due to its simplicity, but from which everything must derive. So you got to remember, um, Matthew is, has a background in mathematics and engineering, I believe, and he's coming at this book and writing this book from a mathematical uh, perspective, which is, uh, I think, what is unique and in, in, in what catches a lot of these insights here. Continuing, as such, the name of God is the principle of all Mosaic laws. For example, a law like, thou shall not lie, is an obvious expression of this identity at the human level. The only difference in this case is that it was expressed in negative terms. When articulated positively, this law becomes, thou shall be true, or words must agree with facts, or heaven must agree with earth. All of these formulations express the same identity, I am what I am, at different scales of reality. 
In theory, every single Mosaic law can be derived as a practical implication of God's identity. However, it would be counterproductive to examine both the, the corpus of the law with this intention. Instead, we will focus entirely on a single example, thou shall not kill, to demonstrate how a trivial law expresses its ramifications or materializes itself at the level of human interactions. Thou shall not kill, but, all, but are all murders equal? What if I kill my enemy, my parents, my child, my servant, my dog? What if I kill someone in an accident or in self-defense? What if I injure someone in a fight and they lose their livelihood and eventually die? What if I fight with a woman and she loses her unborn child as a result? What if my child, servant, or dog kills someone who is responsible? What if my dog kills my neighbor's dog? What if it happens again and again? What if I kill someone who requested it? What if I kill myself? And he has here, see Exodus 21 for answers to some of these questions. And he continues here. So again, these forces, the descending force of answers and the ascending force uh, of questions. Again, this interplay of heaven and earth here. These are the kind of questions that arise when a law is applied to the complexity, applied to the complexity of human interactions and develops into a series of branches. This concretization is essentially what it means for God to blow into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. It refers to a process of materialization in which a purely spiritual identity is fleshed out into its practical ramifications. In the context of biblical cosmology, it is always important to remember that earth is not just the storehouse of matter, but, a, but an enigmatic darkness to be answered by the light of higher identity. In this manner, specific laws are formed by the descent of, of a metaphysical principle into the details of corporeal reality. This material obscurity is necessary to reveal the identity of God to humanity. Otherwise, the highest principle would be too abstract and simple uh, too abstract and simple to know. Footnote. As discussed in the following section, the law is analogous to a tree and the, and the deeds to its fruits. These fruits are concrete facts that point to a higher identity or fruits with their seeds in them. God's identity, which has to, was so far been translated as I am what I am, could also be translated as I shall be what I shall be. This further confirms the symbolism of the seed as a principle that is not yet what it shall be, because it must be planted in the earth to fully be, in fact, what it is in theory. Last paragraph here. On the whole, there must be an exchange between heaven and earth for the knowledge of God within creation. God's identity must lower itself into practical reality by elaborating laws, and the masses of Israelites must raise themselves into significance by embodying them as deeds. Laws bring light and meaning to human events, and human questions or problems provide tangible expressions for God's spirit. Ultimately, the purpose of these interactions is for Adam to fully embody the image of God at the communal scale. All right, chapter four is entitled is another example entitled Authority and Power. And again, so we can think of these two forces, authority coming from above and power coming from below, right? The power reflects questions, support, and expresses an expression. And the authority is, re represents answer, answers and in informing, right? Um, he talks later in an example here. From above, we have authority. And from above, we have anointing. And from below, we have power, support. And from below, we have tithing. So anointing and tithing are reflected in this duality as well. And the uh, last chapter, last uh, paragraph. In the Bible, transmissions of power and authority at the communal level are usually symbolized by tithing and anointing. Tithing is a transmission of matter and power from below, in which portions of material resources are offered up to support the head. And anointing is a transmission of meaning and authority or light from above. Of course, there is nothing mysterious about any of these ideas because they are still in effect in modern societies. However, in today's world, these interactions are seen only as the practical necessities of a state. While they were probably seen as representations of cosmic patterns in the ancient world. In that context, anointing and tithing were translations of heavenly and earthly influences at the communal scale. All 
All right, next section is uh, entitled Adam's Descendants as Microcosms. At microcosm. Chapter 25 moves us towards Adam's descendants as microcosm. Again, exploring this uh, pattern of heaven and earth and Adam being mediator uh, through the uh, multiplying force of Cain and Abel, right? And then Seth will come into play here and we'll see how this fractal pattern of multiplication, you know, be fruitful and multiply is expressed here. And I don't know if I'm going to get through all of these chapters. Actually, I'm losing some time and some uh, light. Um, so I'm going to read through this one and maybe, you know, fast forward through a few others here. Um, so, quote, Abel was a herder of flocks and Cain was a worker of the ground. Commentary, like all stories in the Bible, the story of Cain and Abel is a simple narrative with tremendous implications. For that reason, its meaning cannot be fully examined at this point. Instead, the purpose of this chapter is to recognize the cosmic patterns of heaven and earth and their implications in this narrative. Cain and Abel are expressions of Adam in the context of heaven and earth. More precisely, Cain embodies humanity in the context of earth, and Abel embodies humanity in the context of heaven. There are specializations. These are specializations of Adam's cosmic role as mediator between heaven and earth. Remember, Cain uh, murdered his brother Abel, right? So we have there we have a discontinuity uh, or a decoherence between heaven and earth. And Cain, who worked the ground, was uh, reflective of this earth pattern. And Abel, who, um, who controlled his flock, is an example of this heavenly pattern, but both the, at, the, at the level of humanity. So, quote from Genesis 4, the farmer and the pastor. The human knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have acquired a man with the help of the Lord. She then gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel was a herder of flocks, and Cain was a worker of the ground. Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruits of the ground, and Abel brought an offering from the fat of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord regarded Abel and his offering, but disregarded Cain and his offering. Commentary, these two specializations are extremely important in the Bible as symbols of the distinction between spiritual and material mediation. In this context, Abel is the prototype of heavenly authority and priesthood at the communal level. He is a contemplative individual concerned with spiritual matters and the higher meaning of reality. On the other hand, Cain is the prototype of earthly power and kinghood at the communal level. He is more concerned with possessing the land and dealing with its practical realities. And there's an example here of the levels of reality, right? Um, at the bottom, we have mineral. Above that, we have vegetable, then animal and spiritual, right? So Abel was responsible for the animal and the spiritual, and Cain was responsible for the vegetable and the mineral. Further, further on, he says here, uh, in this context, Abel was responsible for lowering the spiritual into the animal and raising the animal into the spiritual. Therefore, Abel is, uh, is also the prototype of the priest who specializes in offering refined flesh to God. On the other hand, Cain was responsible for lowering the vegetable into the mineral and raising the mineral into the vegetable. Thus, Cain and his offspring are the prototypes of builders and smiths who specialize in making tools and vessels from refined minerals, bricks, and material. This basic pattern of story can be interpreted at many scales of reality as follows. One, the body and the spirit at the individual level. Two, the kingly and the priestly at the communal level. And three, materially, materiality, materially and spiritually inclined nations at the intercommunal level. I'm going to quote here. Adam knew his wife. She bore a son and called his name Seth. For God has set for me another seed under Abel because Cain killed him. Commentary. In a perfect world, Cain and Abel would have reached an, uh, an agreement by which spiritual and material realities would have been joined correctly. In that case, Abel would cover Cain with spiritual meaning from heaven, and Cain would support Abel with physical power from the earth. Again, here is the, the main thrust right through the story of Cain and Abel. So in the case of heaven and earth cohering, Abel would cover Cain with spiritual meaning from heaven, and Cain would support Abel with physical power from the earth. 
Unfortunately, this crucial agreement between authority and power could not be reached at this juncture. And here we have a footnote. Abel means breath, with the connotation of vanity because he was just breath, or bodiless meaning. This means that Abel was full of lofty ideas without concrete facts to support them. He was a great spirit without physical power. On the other hand, the word Cain is connected to nest, because Cain's most important function was to build a stable physical reality, a temple or nest, to host a higher spiritual identity. Continuing on here with a quote. <clears throat> Adam lived 130 years and bore a son in his image, and he called his name Seth. Adam's third son, Seth, symbolizes a return to the image of Adam, which is also the image of God. The following verse also indicates a recovery of the image of Adam, humanity, on a smaller scale and a renewed communication with the heavenly identity, the name of God. In general, Seth's lineage represents a new and more successful attempt at finding an agreement between heaven and earth. Quote, To Seth was born a son. He called his name, his name Enosh, humanity, and they started calling, the name of, calling on the name of the Lord. In general, the genealogy of Adam is built around a series of embedded microcosms where the same patterns are reiterated at various scales. Thus, even in the generations of Seth, there is another reiteration of the basic cosmic pattern. In this case, Enoch dealt with the higher spiritual levels, whereas Noah dealt with animals and material levels. Remember, Noah had the ark. Enoch received the ability to make tools from the angels. A footnote here. There are widely held traditions about Enoch's communion with angels and his final ascent into heaven. As for Noah, his association with Cain is clear as the builder of the ark and is a man of the ground. Again, it's, it's fascinating to see these patterns play out in so many of these stories. And um, I'm going to leave it there for now. We still have four more chapters to get into. And these next chapters about building the temple um, are really... Um, really fascinating, and also the cherubim of Ezekiel. Again, if you're not familiar with these terms or these concepts, you can read up on them, but I'm, I'm, I'm coming at, to them, at them not so familiar with them. But again, using this, this rubric of heaven and earth, these forces, uh, these fundamental forces at play can give us a window into these uh, and insights into these kind of cryptic stories. So guys, again, appreciate you uh, chiming in and, and the comments below. And um, yeah, see you next time.